day here. I'm Dustin Bryant. And I'm Kat Ferris. And we're the hosts of Awkward Insurance. Thanks for continuing to tune in to the channel. We really appreciate you and want to ensure that we are staying connected to what matters most to you and the inner workings of the daily insurance journey you have. Podcasts at SCIC.com. That's podcasts with an S at SCIC.com is set up just for you to send us feedback. Tell us about your favorite moments, nominate someone for a conversation you'd love to be a fly on the wall for, or just let us know about any topics that you'd love to hear or learn more about. We are ready to have a super amazing conversation with our guest today. She is an amazing example. I've already got goosebumps. Okay. She is an amazing example of a strong and successful female in the insurance industry. Natalie Russell is with us today. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me today. I'm excited to be here. I'm so excited to see you. I have not seen your face in so long, and I'm just super excited to actually see you smiling, and you're so gorgeous today. So in our last episode, we started conversations about diverse cognitive abilities. Kat and I explored both of our struggles with ADHD, and those conversations have continued off the mic too. The struggles we share are real, at times hilarious, and something we must power through every day. So seriously, Kat, last night I was working on writing a learning guide and wanted to look up a common form definition of a word, which is just the word mm-hmm. judgment, because I was looking for legal judgment or law judgment, you know, just mm-hmm. you know, common term there to give anybody who didn't know what the word judgment was about. So I Googled and ended up on Miriam and Webster and got sucked into the word of the day. It was really late at night. My husband was there. My 11 year old was there. I was like, hey, word of the day. And you can press this little button and listen to it. Mm-hmm. Anyways, once I clicked on that, there were other words that were word of the day. And the one that we landed on was defenestration, Ooh. <laughs> which sounded really weird to me and honestly sounded a little risque, mm-hmm. but it quite literally means to throw someone, not something, someone out of a window. <gasps> Have you ever used the phrase, I'm going to throw you out of a window? Uh, I know I've thought that several times. Not only shaking your head, no. <laughs> I've thought it in my head, but I've kept my mouth shut because there have been more than a few people I would like to defenestrate. Well, you're a better person than I then, but I thought no. it was a Southern thing. And Natalie, you're shaking your head no. You've never told your children you're going to throw them out of a window? No. Off a balcony? No. Never going to throw them anywhere. <laughs> Well, you know, my husband and I were not perfect parents, and we satirically will often tell our children, if you do that again, I'm going to throw you out of a window, which our therapist tells us we're not supposed to say, but it happens at least two or three times a day. So as we were like mulling this around, we were just giggling about it, and we came to terms that from now on, we would say, if you do that again, you will suffer imminent defenestration, which was just not okay because I just don't know why it's not okay to just say I'm going to throw you out of a window instead of I'm going to defenestrate you. Because defenestrate just sounds so much cooler. (laughs) And you're teaching your kids vocabulary at the same time. So it really is a good learning moment. It was an interesting path to nowhere. Um, Oh gosh, which, oh, it leads us back to what we were talking about, ADHD and getting distracted. (laughs) (laughs) Because about 30 minutes later, I suddenly remembered that I was supposed to be working on something. And my husband just looks at me and goes, so this is what you work on all day? And I was like, not really, no, but this is how I get distracted. (laughs) Just (laughs) Googling uh, legal judgment and end up on throwing my kids out of a window. But our guest today with us has a diverse cognitive ability of her own. And we're going to explore that a little bit today. And we'll get into other things. But um, Natalie, I'd really like to start there, if you don't mind, in a conversation that I was having with you about doing this podcast, which was originally supposed to be focused on marketing. And it will be. We'll get there. I found out that you have dyslexia. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience with dyslexia? Because I really feel like this is a subject, since we've got college students that take some of our programs and high school students, I know that I've got friends that have children with dyslexia, and there's always this worry as a parent that they don't know where they're going to fit in in a professional world. And once I found out that you have dyslexia, and I know how crazy successful you are, I thought you would be perfect to have a conversation with about this. Sure. So um, I 
I had a lot of problems with reading when I was um, in grade school. And actually, when I was in probably second grade, the principal and teachers actually talked to my mother about holding me back because of my reading challenges. And my mom had reading challenges, but with my mom, they didn't know about dyslexia back then or they didn't talk about it. So my mom was like, absolutely not. We're not going to have her repeat. We're just going to get someone to help her. And we hired a tutor who helped me every day with reading and helped me overcome some of those challenges. But what I like to share about it is that when I was in grade school, my grades were terrible. They were C's and D's, and that's about all I could get in grade school. And I tried. But one thing that dyslexia taught me was that I have to try a little bit harder. And also it taught me how to study. So when I actually got into middle school or junior high, my grades started getting a little bit better. I started making B's and C's. And by the time I got to high school, I had straight A's. Um, I was on National Honor Society. I got a scholarship to college. Things just started falling into place. But how this all happened was I had to try harder where my friends were going out and playing and doing things and they got all their work done at school. I did not. I actually had to come home. Yeah. It took me three times as long to read something as it does somebody else. It still does, actually. My brain won't let me skim things. I have to really focus on words and I move slowly. But one thing it taught me was how to study and how to strive for something. And I think that's why. I'm where I am today and how I succeeded in college, um, in high school, and other things that have been a challenge in life. So this dyslexia actually wasn't a disability. It actually helped me. Whereas I like to say, hi, my brother's got a big scholarship to go to college and they never had to study or do anything. Well, when they got to college, they didn't do so well because they didn't know how to study. Right. I did very well in college because I already knew how to do that because that's all I knew. So the dyslexia was a challenge at first, but it's a blessing in the end. So how did you study? I mean, because I mean, uh, that's a skill that I imagine just even your work, you're, you're transferring a lot of those studying skills to what you do on a daily basis. Like how, how does that work for you? Today, it's not, I don't even notice Mm -hmm. Uh, today it's it's just something my brain has learned to deal with long ago so really it's not a challenge the only challenge I have is that I read extremely slow Mm -hmm. and also that I'm terrified to give speeches in front of people and I think that has to do with my dyslexia if I'm sitting down in front of a group just talking I have no problem talking their ear off really what it boils down to is years ago my brain learned how to overcome those challenges it just takes a little bit longer for me to read something, but that's okay. I mean, I, I can read just fine. And I'll add to that, my oldest son and my youngest son both have dyslexia. Wow. So I, I think it's a hereditary thing. And my oldest son is in college now, and he's been on the dean's list. And our youngest son, he's doing well too. So Natalie, um, interesting story. When you found out that your children also had dyslexia, however that came about. How did you feel as a parent, especially a parent that also struggled with dyslexia too? Honestly, I wasn't that worried. It was a little bit frustrating with my first child um, when we found out just because I didn't realize that he had dyslexia. And so I was getting very frustrated because his twin sister was putting forth the effort to read and she was doing very well in kindergarten. And I just thought my son was being lazy, honestly. And once it dawned on me that, ah, he could have dyslexia too, we went and got him tested and we immediately hired somebody who was a specialist and she did a fabulous job. And within a year of him having tutoring, he got up to reading level and he has done well ever since. Our youngest son, same thing. Although I didn't get mad at him, Mm -hmm. I figured out new from experience that there, there was probably an issue, and then so we've gotten him help, and he's doing great. Well, he's 11, so he's just in sixth grade, but he's doing very well with his reading. Oh, that's amazing. Well, I mean, as we stated before, I tell my children I'm going to throw them out of a window, so there are no perfect parents here. <laughs> <laughs> we all learn as we go. <laughs> yes, yes, we do. Random question about dyslexia, but does the different, like, does having different fonts on your phone or your screen 
help mitigate that? Not me, but I'll tell you mine's mild. I've, I know some people, there's levels of it. So some people have a, a more severe case than I do. Mm-hmm. So, and I think my sons, both of them have a, a fairly mild case. So they got over it easily or not got over it. They overcame it easily. Um, but I know there's other children who have severe cases that they have more challenges. So that could be, but that's, does not bother me at all. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, one thing that really stands out to me, and I constantly lose track of thought whenever I'm listening to people speak, but this one stuck with me is that just not too long ago, you said you don't notice it as much anymore. And I think that is a really powerful message, especially for a parent who has a child with dyslexia that may have never been acquainted with dyslexia before. Mm-hmm. I know for me as a parent, the, a first time parent, especially, you know how you wrap them in bubbles and you only feed them organic and you make their baby food for the first. And then by the third kid, you're like, here, here's Gerber off the shelf and open the jar yourself kind of situation. And open the window. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But for a parent who's experiencing a diagnosis for the first time and you don't have the background and the knowledge to deal with it, to hear that as you got older and now as an adult and particularly a successful adult, that you don't notice it as much because you've learned how to live your life with it and not let it be a hindrance. I think that's a really powerful message for any parent who might be listening or even a student who might be thinking, I'm, I'm not going to amount to much because this dyslexia is just going to get in my way all the time. So I do have a question, though. As you, um, as you developed professionally, starting really early in wherever your career was, did you want to tell employers that you had dyslexia? Was it something you felt like you needed to disclose or was it something that you kept to yourself and just worked through it the best you could? How did you deal with that? How would a, how would anybody deal with that right now? Honestly, I didn't tell anybody. Um, so the first person I told was actually my most recent manager that I have right now. I just told him probably two months ago when I told him about this podcast. (laughs) So he did not know. And I actually told him he knows that I don't like to do public speaking and stand up in front of people and do that kind of stuff. And I've done um, several workshops on public speaking just to try to overcome that. And I told him, he said, you know, when I think about it, I think they're related that the dyslexia, I don't like somebody to have me read out loud. No, I don't mm-hmm. want somebody to say, oh, we're in a class. Will you read this passage? Or whatever. Right. I do not like that at all. Don't, because I want to read it beforehand and make sure that I can process it and I can read faster. In fairness, though, I think I, I heard that there are more people afraid of public speaking than they are of their own death. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I know for me, I'm fine with public speaking, but not if I have to read something verbatim because then it's going to throw me off. Yes. I'd much rather just get up there and talk. But I know for especially in insurance, so much of what we do is reading and parsing out things. I mean, you have to, I mean, an apostrophe, you know, can yes. make a difference in, in how something is understood. So what has your career path been like? Well, I've always been in insurance. So mm-hmm. I started out in insurance, actually, technically, when I was probably about 10 or 11. That's my dad <laughs> owned an agency. Mm-hmm. And um, he would have paperwork everywhere. And I started filing back then. But honestly, when I was, in, uh, let's see, probably it was the summer of following 11th grade that I actually started working in my dad's office. 12th grade, I did a class called CEO, which is career orientation or something like that, that I went to school for two or three classes my senior year. And the rest of the day, I went and worked in a professional environment. And then, so that's kind of how I got my start. I was not going to be in insurance. That was not what I was going to do. But I liked having sure was it. off. <laughs> no, <laughs> I did not want to do it. So, um, but it just fit the bill at the time. I could go to work four or five hours a day, make, um, make some extra spending money and then have my evenings off. I danced for 14 years. And so it allowed me to have my evenings off. And then um, I went to college actually at ULR. So I lived at home whoop, whoop. and I worked yeah, I worked at um, <laughs> insurance or at my dad's office 
during my college years. And again, I wasn't going to stay in insurance. My degree is criminal justice. It has nothing to do with insurance. Oh my so, gosh, Natalie, you guys have so much in common. How have we not yeah. had these conversations? So I too <laughs> am an alum of UALR, which is the University of Arkansas at Little Rock. Natalie and I both reside here in Arkansas. I too have degrees in criminal justice. And now I just feel like our heartstrings are connected. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I had no idea. But my, I was really going to be an FBI agent. It was my, really what I wanted to do. Um, but where I started, I started out as a receptionist with my dad in the office as a senior in high school. The day I turned 18, which was in the summer following 12th grade, my dad had me sitting in the class taking the um, prerequisites. And then I got my license in 1992. I stayed in insurance. Um, I looked at going into the FBI, but I kind of held back because I decided I wanted to have children and I didn't want to travel. And I kind of just put that on hold, stayed in insurance, worked with my dad for 10 years, loved it. He sold the agency. So within the agency, I was a receptionist. Then I was a CSR. Then I was a producer. Then I was like an office manager. And then he sold the agency. At the time, I didn't want to buy the agency. I was going to go into criminal justice. <laughs> um, so, and that's not what actually happened. I got a job with Blue Cross Blue Shield and was a rep and traveled the state. And that's actually where I met my husband. He was a Blue Cross rep as well. We dated for about a year almost and got married and we couldn't both work in the same department. So I went back to PNC. I became a captive agent and learned a little bit at, at the captive world. I worked at AAA off of Rodney Parham as a producer for about three and a half to four years. I didn't enjoy the captive side a whole lot, um, knowing that I worked independent with my dad. So I went back to the independent world. I worked as a marketing rep for MetLife for a year, went back to the agency side for a few years then actually went back to the company side. So I've kind of been in several different roles. Most of my experiences as a, uh, as a producer on the agent side, small agency, I have about almost 10 years experience as a marketing rep with uh, two different companies, one being MetLife and one being Safeco. That's where I'm at now. Mm -hmm. uh, but having that agency experience is just makes you a much better marketing rep. I feel like, I can connect with the agency a lot better, um, any of the staff members, because I've been in all their shoes, whether it's a receptionist, a CSR, a producer, a marketing person, an office manager, or even agency owner. Recently, I owned an agency for four years so in Hot Springs, Arkansas. So I was, uh, had bought an existing agency and um, really enjoyed it for the first couple of years. And I was meeting people, I was connecting with clients, building relationships out in the community, loved it. The last two years, we really started growing the agency and we added several staff members. And part of the reason why I decided to go back to Safeco as a marketing rep was because I missed travel after a couple of years. And ironically, I left Safeco because I was tired of traveling. So that was, yeah. So, so the desire to travel brought you back to marketing. Is it just the travel or was it all of the different connections that you were able to make? There's several reasons. What else brought you back to marketing? Because correct me if I'm wrong. Tell me a little bit about the agency uh, that you owned. Wasn't it like an all-female yes, agency? Yes, it was. I don't know why, but I vaguely remember like that being part of marketing is that and I could be wrong, so correct me, but that it was all female and it was really empowering. Really. Yes, it was all female. The previous owner um, who had it, she had just two employees there, or two co-workers. It was all female. That was kind of our desire when I purchased the agency and we ended when I left or sold the agency, there were five females there. We had um, a couple of actually three CSRs uh, slash producers. We didn't have specific roles. So actually, everybody in the office was cross-trained, except when I left, there was a receptionist who was not cross-trained. So there were a total of five of us in the agency when I decided to sell it. We were um, we worked well together. It was a great environment. We worked out in the community together. We just 
we just had a great time in the agency. And again, part of the reason you asked why I wanted to leave or sell the agency, there's a couple of reasons. Towards the end, I felt more like a human resources manager, oh. also accountant. And I wasn't able to go out in the community partly because of COVID, mm. uh, but also because we had grown and I had more responsibilities within the agency for accounting, the marketing piece of it, and also human resources, which I didn't enjoy as much. I enjoyed being in yeah. front of the customer, educating and building that relationship. That's yeah. actually what I do at Safeco. I'm working with the yeah. agency mm -hmm. and building relationships with the agency and helping them overcome their challenges and educating them on the product to help them be successful with Safeco. That's what I, that's the reason why I wanted to come back to Safeco is because I actually get to do what I love to do instead of what I have to do within the agency. Right. Not, not knowing you intensely personal, right. Um, but having known you, known about you, been around you for a, a well around 15 years now, I would have guessed that about you, that it was the heart of the relationships. And, and if I think like if I process your journey myself, I think about your move to the agency from Safeco, which I like, I was devastated when you left Safeco Marketing and I was like, I was shunning the next representative that came into our office until I met TJ and then TJ was really cool. <laughs> um, but I shunned them for a little bit because nobody was going to be as good as Natalie Russell. So, but when I, when I process that though, and think about your move to uh, being an agency owner, I would have thought it was because you wanted to be more intently involved with the customers and have a deeper connection with the policyholders and the business that you're selling and also underwriters and the other producers and you know, just everything that is service level for insurance. So that I think that makes the connection for me that that's, you know, that's what brought you back to marketing is that's where your heart lies and in all of the uh, the administrative pieces of owning an agency is not Natalie Russell. It's not your heart and soul. No, it's not. You're exactly right. I enjoy having those relationships. And when I left Safeco, I, I was kind of heartbroken uh, because I too. lost my relationships with the agencies that I went to and staff and also my relationships that I had built at Safeco. And it took me a little while to feel at home within the agency after I left. I bet it was a good year. I did enjoy what I was doing and building relationships, but at the same time, I was sort of heartbroken. Yeah. And then now I feel back at home, back at Safeco. So and I really enjoy building those relationships again. So really enjoying I feel that so deep. <laughs> when you have a good team and you know what you're doing and you love what you're doing, man, when you make a decision to go somewhere else and you're hoping that it's better, and it always is, in my opinion, it was not a wrong move for you to go into owning an agency. It, it gives you a more rounded perspective. There's always something to learn no matter what you do. Um, but when you leave something that is just so deeply and richly ingrained in you, you, yes. you grieve for it. I agree. Well, and I think it's, I think it's great to recognize what it is that you're passionate about. You know, especially in our society, we... Our society really celebrates that type A, that entrepreneur, yeah. be your own boss, be the hashtag boss babe, stuff like that. But at the end of the day, you have to love what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think it's great that you recognize what you love doing, because how many people are out there still trying to trudge away <laughs> in a role that they think they should be in or they think sounds more impressive, but they're miserable at it? You know, I know for me, I would hate to own my own business like you. I don't want to do all that administrative stuff. I just want to focus right. on what I'm good at. I agree. Um, some of the things that I've learned from my experience was just exactly what an agency owner does. You don't think about everything they do. You don't think about all the administrative tasks, all the, the human resources tasks. Those just inundate you um, with constant hiring of employees or training of employees. That takes up so much time and you really can't focus on what you love to do, which is the education and the relationship building. That just takes up all of your time. So 
I can really relate to that and understand when an agency owner is having staff issues or marketing issues or whatever those issues may be, maybe I can give them some direction and focus from what I've learned from that experience on top of educating them about Safeco and help, helping them succeed with selling Safeco products. Yeah. So I was going to ask, you keep using the term education, which in our world can be used so fluidly in so many different ways. What's the context of the use of education in the way that you're using it? When you say that you, you wanted to focus on the education piece of it, what is that for you? It means many things. Teaching agents about our products, product knowledge, our underwriting, our marketing that we offer at Safeco, just everything that we have to offer, whether it comes from compensation all the way to product knowledge, um, just everything about Safeco that I can teach somebody to help grow their agency. But some of the things that I like to help with have nothing to do with Safeco. It's just If you grow your agency overall by these marketing efforts or by just anything really that that agency is focused on, because I just say, what are you guys focused on? Is it uh, is it marketing? Is it hiring? What is it that maybe we can help you with? Like we have producer courses, we have CSR courses, we have marketing courses. We have so many things that we offer. Really just got to find out what that agency is interested in and where they need help to succeed. It's really just asking those questions, but I like to educate on all of that and teach them how to grow their agency in the way that they want to, because every agency is unique. And I really just have to find what drives that agency and then flip that switch to what we can offer and maybe how we can help them. Yeah. So something else just popped up in my head. You know, agents that write with Safeco, they don't just write with Safeco. They've got many other insurance Mm -hmm. carriers that they write with most of the time. Now, I'm sure there are some exclusive Safeco or Liberty Mutual agents, but all these teachings that you're talking about, that's wholly focused on the agency. Is that where it is for you? Because I mean, as Safeco puts together, and I've attended some of the Safeco training that you were able to help convince leadership to send me to. <laughs> I think one of them was in Oklahoma, which was really fun. But you know that you're working on hopefully building more business for Safeco, but obviously that's going to filter into other insurance companies as well because that agent is learning and growing from your materials. What is what is that like to know that that's happening, or is that the whole intent? It, I mean, there's enough business for everybody. We just want you to be a strong agent. Right. We want you to be a partner with us. And if you're growing your agency, I just expect to get my fair share. If I'm helping you, we know that we're not going to get all of it. We know that we don't fit everybody's needs. We have a certain clientele or a certain group that we go after. And we just yes. yes. So we actually just expect Mm -hmm. you to be a good partner with us and grow your book of business. But if you're growing your whole agency, you're going to, we're going to get our fair share. Right, right, right. Absolutely. Because even if you don't get Safeco the first year, it'll come around eventually. And I I do remember that Safeco had some really specific niches that they liked to be in, whether it was, you know, which home value or number of drivers and vehicles and all of that. But if you could find that sweet spot, man, it was a super sweet spot is what it was. Um, so no, I love that because then it's it's representatives like you, and and this is a good piece of information for insurance agents that are out there as well because they may think I don't grow or I I don't have a lot of business with Safeco. I don't need to attend their training. I don't need to look into that. I don't need help from them. I've got more business over here with another carrier. But knowing that you as a marketing representative, I, I'm sorry, what's your title with Safeco now? Uh, senior territory manager. Senior territory manager, your focus is on the insurance agency and the agent. No matter you've got a small book or a big book with them, you're just focused on growing them because the more you put into your agents and your agencies, the more you're going to get back from them in return. So if you're a Safeco agent out there and you don't have a lot of business, it doesn't mean to write off how awesome their training could be. That's I think that's a good central focus of what it was that you were just sharing with us because I'm, I mean, I'm looking at you and I know you 
and I know how genuine you are, and I know that this isn't just fluff, <laughs> <laughs> that you're focused on the agent and the agency, and you just want to do everything you can to make them better. Right. I want them to succeed. I want their whole agency to grow. Um, of course, I want them to be number one with Safeco, and I want to help their agency grow overall. Um, and we want to win. Everybody wants to win. I, I, you of know, course. I want Safeco to win, but we always aren't going to be the best fit. Uh, for the agency, but if they grow their agency overall, that's a win for me because I've helped them grow their book of business. I've helped them grow their agency. Also, I feel like that if I'm helping them grow their agency, people do business with people they like. Mm -hmm. And if I'm helping them grow their business um, and we're becoming a partner, I like them, they like me, they're going to try to put more business with me. They're going to try to find a way to write business with Safeco even if it's not maybe the most competitive, but they know it's a good product and they know they have somebody behind them that will support them in the event there's an issue. So, and and that's, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to be. Yeah, absolutely. Coming from the carrier side as well and having done training on behalf of a carrier, I mean, I would completely attest to that because there's so much value to be had in those training sessions that are not always going to be just carrier specific. I mean, yeah, you know, you go to a Safeco training or a nationwide training, you're going to be trained on those products, but the insight that you're going to get is valuable across the board. So yeah, for agents, I would say never turn down carrier training, regardless of who's offering it. No, absolutely not. And, you know, even here at the National Alliance, our focus on our education, we use, you know, the basics, the core of ISO language. And insurance companies may take portions or pieces of that. They may mimic it wholly, or they may make their own product completely. So being able to be the best agent out there is knowing your products inside and out. That was one of the biggest transitions for me coming to the National Alliance is because I had to focus in an agency on multiple products. So when a client called in, I didn't know which exclusion I was directly referring to. Of course, I had vague terminology for it, but I'd have to go into their policy. They're specific because, you know, there's like three different types of policies in one carrier sometimes. So their specific product and look at their policy language. And then when I came over here to the National Alliance, there's other academic directors. It's like, oh, that's exclusion B3 under the personal auto policy. And I'm like, it is? <laughs> it was a struggle for me. So yes, at the National Alliance, we teach you those core fundamentals through ISO language that teach you how to navigate through a policy and what the basic general ideas are that are usually consistent between carriers. But going to those carrier trainings and understanding their product, what makes their product unique? What are the specifics? Like, do you have a single loss deductible? You know, and all of that that sets them apart other than just looking at the numbers on the page, which is what the client usually looks at is I've got this amount of coverage for this price instead of knowing that, well, if you separate them, you're going to have two. De- oh, speaking of two deductibles on a single loss, we have a house down the road that caught fire a couple of days ago. Oh. Total mess, total loss. Up in flames. I mean, like you, they brought out the big trucks with the big letters and the spray it down. Mm-hmm. And I was reading the comments of Facebook because that's all where the good information is, right? Is the comments of Facebook. <laughs> and it was like, oh, I don't know a whole lot about firefighting. And I'm like, well, that's where you should have stopped. <laughs> but I don't know a whole lot about firefighting. But when they bring out the big trucks, what I do know is they're, they're not trying to stop the fire. They're trying to knock the building in in order to extinguish the fire at that point. Anyways, drove by it this morning. It's the first time I drove by it since it happened and heard about it. Cars in the garage, the home Mm. is a total loss. Mm. You know, that's what I'm saying. If your client has the product split between two different companies and you've got a deductible for your home and a deductible for your auto, and you didn't let them know that if they kept it with the same company, they only have one deductible at this extremely distressing time. That's where you're going to gain that knowledge is through these carrier trainings and understanding more than just what's on the deck page of a policy. So um, great information. I yeah, I know you agree because they has got that. <laughs> <laughs> Not trying to turn this into a marketing shtick for Safeco, but. <laughs> so like, there is so much to learn from the marketing reps, um, so much to learn about the product, but what happens when you don't have time to get into all the nuts and bolts with products with someone? You know, you are happen to be passing by one of your agencies and and unexpected, 
not that if too many people do unexpected drop-ins anymore, but <laughs> probably not now with COVID. Now you probably have to like <laughs> sign up and verify and yeah, take else. your temperature and get into somebody's age. <laughs> But used to, drop-in meetings were a thing. (laughs) So what would the drop-in meeting look like for you? Honestly, I didn't do drop-in meetings. No? (laughs) All of mine were pretty much scheduled. The only time that I would say it was a drop-in is if an agency called me and specifically asked me to come by Mm -hmm. um, because they knew I was in the area. So I would stop by and help them with whatever their challenge was. But typically... I didn't do unannounced or drop bys. That was a no no. And me. we thank you for it. <laughs> <laughs> There's another marketing rep that I'm friends with, and I razz him all the time for his sporadic pop up meetings. Just- well, so I I know when I was with the carrier, the principal or a few of the people may have known I was coming by, and then I'd show up in the office, and then other people would go, "Oh, okay, you're here." <laughs> so. <laughs> So it may not have been a drop-in meeting for me because, I mean, I'm the same way. I won't even call somebody without giving them a text or an email like, hey, can I call you? Because <laughs> I don't like yeah. unexpected interruptions either. Um, but, yeah, sometimes you don't have time to, to touch base with everybody. So what would those short meetings look like? It really just depended on what it was. I mean, I was well-versed at Safeco, so it really just depended on what they needed. If they had somebody who had a claim issue um, I may stop by and we would uh, do the process or whatever it was for the claim to get them in contact with the right person. So that may be an example. If you're newer to uh, the industry as far as a territory manager, company rep, that would be a little bit more challenging. Um, I think if you were just to do a drop by and not have as much information, nowhere to go to. I think if you've had a few years behind you, then those drop-ins were a lot easier. I mean, they just really just comes with experience. You just know the company, you know who to reach out to. Pretty much if it was a marketing question, I knew who to go to about marketing. If it was a claim question, I knew the person to go to. If it was a, a billing problem, I knew who to go to. So really, I just kind of pivoted to whatever the issue was. And we just resolved it, hopefully, while I was in the agency. Mm-hmm. And now you are the go-to. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like to me, like if you're a newer person in the marketing side of this, yeah, your focus needs to be knowing who is your resource until you're capable right. of being mm-hmm. able to deliver that information. Be comfortable in saying, I don't know, but I'll find somebody who does know so that you continue and right. then be accountable for that. Own that, please, because there is nothing worse than somebody that comes in and says, I'll get someone to help you on this. And then you never hear back from somebody Mm -hmm. and you have to say, well, Michelle told me that she was going to talk to Rick and they're like, we don't have a Michelle, (laughs) you know? (laughs) Well, yes, I agree that that will make me crazy. So I I do agree if you're newer as a territory manager, that'd be a little bit tough, but all you have to do is say, Hey, I don't know the answer to that. And honestly, when I came back to Safeco back in February, that a lot of people had changed. I didn't know who the contacts were, and I still don't know who some of them are. But I'm learning as I yeah. go, and I just tell somebody, hey, I don't know who that person is. Let me find out. Yeah. And I think it's important for people in agencies to understand that the phrase marketing rep is really just kind of a misnomer. Because when people in the agency hear the term marketing rep, they think, okay, this is going to be the person with like the donuts and the little tchotchkes, but you're really more of their phone a friend. (laughs) You know, you're their, you're their resource because especially in dealing with a large carrier, there are so many numbers to call and different departments and things like that. And it's hard, especially as an independent agent to keep up with all of that. So you're their go-to. You do so much more than just marketing. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. I usually tell everybody, um, I know a little bit about everything, but I'm a master at nothing. <laughs> Aww, that's not true. That is true. <laughs> that, that is, is true. Not. So if you come to me, I can find who the expert is if I don't know the answer. That's my job. My job is to help you figure out whatever the problem is and to get to the right person. That's part of my job. But really, I, I do like the tease. I'm not a master at underwriting. <laughs> I'm not a master at claims. If you ask me a generic question, I'm probably going to know the answer to it. But if you go in the weeds of something, I'm not. But I can get you to the right person who is. Yeah. And I think that's very important and I do it very quickly. Yep. Absolutely. 
Love everything that we have spoken about today. I am really happy that you were comfortable talking about dyslexia today. Um, I think that was a really great message. And, you know, just to be able to, if everybody will think back for a minute to think about the path that Natalie has taken and, and the struggles that she had at first, and now she doesn't even realize that she has those struggles and she has been so successful in her career. You know, I, I really don't want to say that she's moved forwards and backwards, but she's made the right steps in her career that were right for her. And before we close today, I want to reiterate something that I live by. It was something that uh, everyone has probably heard and in so many different places. And I recently heard it out of the mouth of our co-founder, Dr. William T. Hold, in a video series that the National Alliance is using to highlight Dr. Hold's legacy. Go check it out on our LinkedIn or any of our social media pages because we're posting those um, for his legacy. And what he said was just goes to show you one person can make a tremendous difference in your life. So while Natalie will not give herself props for being the master of anything, she is the master because Natalie and I have crossed paths so many times over the last 15 years since I started my career. I was a baby and I'd, she didn't even know me when I started. She'd actually left, but man, she left behind a legacy. Natalie Russell used to work here and this is where she's gone and she was amazing. But what was even more amazing is I don't think she realizes what kind of impact that she's had on my life. I'm going to start crying because I'm just an emotional person, okay? <laughs> she probably never knew it at the time, but she was someone that I watched early in my career and I still do. She had gone before me on a journey to starting a family that was going to become a similar journey for me. And um, I could see through her that it was possible to be a mother and a business professional at, a, at the same time. And I was only, eh, I was in my early 20s. So there weren't a lot of role models for me to see in my career path, the direction that I could take. I've continued to watch her throughout her career and my career in awe of the way that she navigates her career and motherhood at the same time. And while we've just explored that Natalie started marketing and through various moves has come back and forth again, I won't say that she's moving backwards and forwards, but she, that she's made all the moves that she needs to make to ensure her success and her happiness and the future of her family. So Natalie, you may not have realized it, but you were being watched and I promise I wasn't stalking you, <laughs> but, but you led a journey in such an exemplary way that when I faced adverse comments about balancing my own motherhood and profession, I knew exactly what I needed to do. Without hesitation, it was to put my family first. And I learned that through you. So when I said earlier that our heartstrings are connected, they really are because I've just I've always been drawn back to you. So I want to thank you for being that in my career for me. And you just never know when one person can make a tremendous difference in your life. Thank you so much. Yeah. It was very sweet. Um, <laughs> and I honestly had no idea. And um, and I did not mean to cry. <laughs> yeah. Don't do that because you'll cause me to cry. So I don't want to do that. So all right, listeners, talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> We're all a little verklempt over here. <laughs> Woo! I had that planned out for a minute, but I didn't realize it was so emotional for me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for this conversation today. Kat, thank you for being an amazing co-host with me. Natalie, I truly appreciate you being on this conversation with me. And I hope that we can have many more conversations to come because you are a master at what you do, and you have a wealth of knowledge to offer everyone around you. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed today, and I appreciate y'all taking the time to talk to me and invite me to the show. Um, and if you need somebody in the future, I'll be glad to talk again. So I appreciate it so much, and I enjoyed it today. Thank you. You got it. Thank you. Woo! All right, Mac Attack. Thanks for hanging around and listening to another awkward conversation in insurance. Stay tuned for new episodes from Awkward Insurance wherever you listen to your podcasts. And be sure to check out the National Alliance on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, or at scic.com. Now go forth and be awkward. Toodles. Toodles. Toodles.